my name is Batya Friedman. I'm one of the co-directors of the lab. I'm on the faculty at the Information School. And um, I'm particularly excited for our lecture today because from the very beginning when we started this series, we talked about having an artist and um, bringing someone into our community who would ask us to look at these questions, these complicated questions around um, technology, but from the lens of, of an artist. And um, Taeyun Choi is that person today. But let me begin tonight with a land acknowledgement. Um, as you all know, the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this borrowed land on which we stand, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Squamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. We pay respect to the elders, past and present, as well as the living descendants and future generations of the Coast Salish. Turning now to the Tech Policy Lab, the Tech Policy Lab is about six or seven years old on this campus. Um, I have the pleasure of co-directing it with Ryan Callow here from the law school and Yoshi Kono from computer science. And it's our mission to, in all the ways that we can, help um, the university, the city of Seattle, across Washington, the nation, and the globe move towards more inclusive, wiser tech policy. And we do that work in a whole host of ways. Um, this lecture series being one of those. Turning now to our distinguished lecturer, um, I'd like first um, to invite you to ask yourself several questions. First, reflect on all the different technologies you encountered today. Perhaps it was a smartphone, like this one I have here. Maybe there was a camera, a sensor. Perhaps it was a website that recorded and sold data about a purchase you made. Or maybe an app pushed a notification to you asking for your attention, perhaps demanding your attention. Further still, maybe for better or for worse, you were invisible to these technologies. And how would you describe that interaction? Think about that for a minute. Did they enable you? Did they disable you? Exploit you? Elevate you? And how might these interactions be different? These are questions frequently asked by those of us who study, design, and build digital systems. It is very challenging to come up with original answers to these kinds of questions. And the UW Tech Policy Lab is very excited to host Taeyun Choi in part because of the way he responds to these very questions. Taeyun is an artist, educator, and activist. His work blends all three of these roles and invites us to reimagine technology, how we experience it in the present, and how we might build it in the future. Weaving together computation, activism, teaching, and art, Taeyun works to create physical and digital experiences of community, stewardship, reflection, and joy while seeking to challenge institutional power and dominant narratives. As an artist, Taeyun has exhibited work in New York City, Seoul, and Shanghai. He's been an artist in residence at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's workspace in New York, the Frank Ratchi Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and at Art Center Nabi in Seoul. He has received commissions from Art Plus Technology Lab at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and at the SEMA Biennial Media City in Seoul. As an educator in 2013, Choi co-founded the School for Poetic Computation, a school, quote, organized around exploring the creative and expressive nature of computational approaches to art and design, end quote, whose goal is, and this is the part I particularly like, to promote completely strange, whimsical, and beautiful work. Currently, Taeyun teaches at the Interactive Telecommunications Program in the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. He also organizes sessions and teaches classes on electronics, drawing, and social practice at the School for Poetic Computation. As an activist, he's been focusing on unlearning the wall of disability and normalcy and enhancing accessibility and inclusion within art and technology. Across so much of his work, Taeyun invites us to consider care, how we might learn from care, 
not just to build different or better technologies, but to learn to envision other ways of living with and for one another. Now it is our great privilege to learn from him. So please join me in welcoming Taeyun Choi. Thank you. Thanks so much, Batya, and thanks to the community here. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Whenever I give talks, I essentially want to do one thing. I'm trying to get to know you, and I'm going to try to do that today. It's, it's, it's quite a large audience, so I don't know if I can get everybody's name, but I'm going to try to get a sense of you, and hopefully we connect, and hopefully we continue our conversations. Uh, the structure of the talk is that I'll present what I've done, at the school and in my art and organizing practices for about 45 minutes and we have 15 minutes for conversations, questions, and the remaining 20 minutes or so I'm going to invite you for a participatory activity that will involve moving around and using our bodies to explore different senses of being together. So just to give you a sense of the structure of the evening. And the message of the talk is that I started to think about computing as a creative medium for about 15 years ago. And more recently, I've been thinking about this as a community project, and then my organizing and teaching as a social practice. So to think about computing as a community technology, and to think about organizing as a social practice, and I'll, I'll try to unpack those words as I go today. The music that we were listening to before we all settled in was uh, one of my favorite musicians. Her name is Yeji. Anybody know her? Yeah, some, some of the undergrads are like, yeah. <laughs> no, she's a Korean American DJ, a producer based in Brooklyn. Um, she's amazing. Her work is really cool. Um, I think it really combines what I aspire in my art practice, which is just um, very innocent and a very honest approach to the craft and also exploration of your identity through what you are passionate about. So for her, it's music, fashion, and etc. For me, it's computing, drawing, and storytelling. This is where you could find me on Twitter and GitHub is a tchoi8 and SFPC. And on Instagram, I'm at drawing drawing, D-R-W-N-G, two times. Um, I share this because I want to engage with you. If you have any questions that you don't want to share um, with the public, feel free to ask me online and we can talk. The key questions that I was sharing with you is that how can we use art and technology for social justice? And this is a problematic uh, approach. The word of use is very problematic. So I'm putting out there to provoke you. And this question could also be structured differently to say, how can we think about uh, technology and justice through creative expression and vice versa? I'm particularly interested in thinking about learning and unlearning environments. And learning environments such as this of educational spaces and unlearning environments such as the social movement or your community groups or your family. And I'm particularly interested in making spaces accessible and inclusive for disabled people, que um, queer people, trans people, people of color. And I'm not sure if this is possible, but I do want to talk about the film Parasite. Because um, as if you have seen it, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. And if you haven't, just the one line is that it's a, a very a dark comedy about the class disparity in South Korea, but it really resonated with a lot of people around the world, and it won a bunch of awards this year. And for me, this film uh, indicates something that I find deeply problematic in the societies, uh, and societies meaning Korea, but also in the US and other places. So while, as much as entertaining this film is, I find it deeply triggering in some ways, and I, I'm trying to get to that. Probably not directly, but I hope I show you some of the ways I think about society, power, capital, and institutions at large. And this is a land acknowledgement that I, uh, I borrowed from the internet, but uh, since we had it in the beginning, I will skip it. But that is not to say I take it lightly. Uh, the way a friend of mine, Neta Bomani, um, told me that land acknowledgement, just you know, talking about the history or the indigenous people, it's not enough. So what can you do? Uh, what is the thing that you can do on a stolen land? And Neta suggested that the most respectful thing you could do as a settler is to pay the rent. So how do I do that? 
a part of the fee that I get for speaking here tonight, I'm gonna donate to a local organization that is run by indigenous people. So that's a way of paying rent to the history, right? So, and I recommend you do that in every time you make any income in any places to think about your connections with the stewards of the land that came before you. So that's the overview. And I'm gonna get into the poetic computation and what that is. So what is a computer, really? We like to say that computer is where math meets language and logic meets electronics. And we like to think about computer as an artistic and creative medium. I'm very fascinated by computers, and this is a technical stack that I try to make it into an illustration. So at the core, there's a solid, which is a physics. So the state of transistors switching from one state to the other. Uh, we could build logic gates with that. Um, you know, NAND gates, XOR gates, those who are technical in the room might understand that as the foundation of computational uh, blocks, which becomes this microarchitecture. And from there, we can have machine code, assembly, um, applications, such as the software that I'm using to show this slide. But more interestingly, let's just think about the right side of the slide, where we can see the transition solid to rigid to plastic, right? To the plastic spaces where you can receive and give forms. Most of us use computers in the crust level, just in the applications and network level. And we access data that's on the cloud. And sometimes we think about the infrastructures that are underneath. I think the most interesting thing is that all of these layers are connected with each other. They're interdependent on each other. And as much as the computers like to you know, present themselves as invisible or seamless, you know, it's reliant on the physical things. There's a famous uh, tweet that is often miscredited for me. I, I did not say that, but some people think I did, um, which is that computers are essentially rocks that are tricked into thinking. And I think that's really funny, and it's so true. These are all just rocks that are oscillating at a certain frequency that are appearing to be communicating with each other. So this is pretty cute, and I like making drawings like this and talking about this for a wide range of audience. But let's just think about the history of computing and the ethics of technology at large. On the one hand, we have ENIAC programmers who are calculating the ballistics trajectory. And um, you know, while it's important to celebrate the female engineers in the history of computing, it's also important to note they were you know, designing and um, kind of enabling these weapons that were destructive and were harmful for the people and the environment. Most of the computers that we use today have von Neumann architecture. And you can see him um, talking really happily with Oppenheimer right next to the Advat machine. And we can understand the consequences of computing machines were you know, very harmful. So the history of computing is never separate from the history of military and also industrialization. And that legacy still continues to today with all the artificial intelligence and other complex machines that we develop. The school that I co-founded is based on this building, uh, currently called West Bath. Uh, it's an artist residency. But it used to be home for the Bell Labs. And before that, it was a home for the Western Electrics. Electrics. And you know, if you understand New York, this is right next to the High Line, so the, uh, the trains are coming uh, under, into the building at some point. Really interesting people worked there. The one was Clark Shannon, as many of you might know, uh, oftentimes understood as the father of the information age, if you can allow me for the patriarchal metaphor for a second. And he understood that electrical circuit could be designed to perform you know, binary operations. And he had a really powerful and um, kind of influential career in the CS and military. And you can see that his life lasted for a very long time until 2001. On the other hand, Alan Turing's life was cut short. And that's entirely because he was gay or he was queer. And I like to show this image to our students to say that we want our space to be inclusive for people like Turing, well, people who don't fit into the general idea of uh, who's an engineer, who's a technical. 
And I think it's really interesting to think that Alan Turing worked in the same building as Shannon for uh, two summers. Um, and he was working for the British Secret Service and Shannon was working for the American government. So they couldn't talk about the code, but they could talk about more philosophical questions like can machines ch play chess? Can machines uh, think? And I think these are the uh, questions that, that we still ask today. And that legacy and the, the loss is something that we think about a lot. The building was also home for artists like Merce Cunningham and John Cage, who are very important Fluxus artists. And also the Shockley and his team presented the transistors in the same building. They developed in New Jersey, but the Bell Lab still owned the building at that point. So that history of art and technology is very important for us, and we try to create different narratives for the future of that. This is an image of uh, some of the students from two years ago. And they come from different parts of the world for a 10 weeks program. And we teach code electronics, critical theory, and poetry. Um, and this is where it gets interesting. Um, it's an artist-run school. We don't give credits. Uh, we don't give degrees. People come here because they want to learn to become artists, or they want to learn more technical skills um, with their artistic ideas. And it's been so rewarding to be part of a healthy community that's, that's growing and really passionate about what we're doing. I think the big the narrative of the talk that I want to share with you is that as much as I'm going to talk about the techniques and the beauty and the aesthetics of the things, it's really about the community that's important. And one thing that is still a little difficult for me to talk about in public was that um, some people used to criticize for being a white space because a lot of the students were white, a lot of the teachers were white. And it took quite a few years of very intentional outreach and changing how we run our program to be more welcoming for people, who, people of color, women of color, the queer and trans people of color, and disabled people. And that's the, the real message that I want to share with you today is like, how can we make the spaces like this, the privileged spaces of academia or the technology spaces or art spaces more welcoming for other people? And this is an image of a group of friends and teachers and students of the school just being really happy. And they're part of a collective called Bufu. And they're a queer, a black and Asian community group that you know, think about the justice and, uh, justice and equity work through organizing music and other kinds of expression. And I think having them in the space has been so good. And it just feels different than any other schools that I've been part of. I studied fine arts, and then I studied engineering at a very like, rigorous environment. So none of those spaces had this kind of a play and joy with both art and technology. This is what our space looks like. And I think I'll just give you a brief uh, view of the space just to have an idea. Does it have a USB connector on it? No, you have to plug it through the Arduino. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're not dangerous, but it, because it will shoot a spike up. Um, so if you wanted to get started, you can use your other, one of your... ...was to use the... This English is a critical theory language, class. Like alphabet, but like you would be talking zero, zero, zero to one and zero, zero to zero, zero. If you multiply it works with... It's actually a student touch, uh, teaching. Into the hard disk. And I make and food. Mixing it. Yeah, there's all of these consolidation of data into the CPU. That's gonna do arithmetic logic unit. That's gonna be cooking. Yeah, that's part of a CPU dumpling project that I do. Well, you get the idea. It's, it's really a warm community. And um, I think the difference between academia, the traditional institutions, and us is that it's, um, 
we design our code of conduct together with the students. So we try to be inclusive of their needs and what they want in the space. And we prioritize uh, practitioners who are pushing the boundary of what is art and technology. Um, so the result is that you know, we have teachers and students who may have a PhD or people who don't have high school degrees. And the fact that they could teach each other and coexist in a space is very rewarding. Uh, this is an image. Just create. To make something like a one-bit computer, I think for engineers, this might be quite uh, straightforward. It's just a NAND logic gates that manipulated into a clock, half adder, and a latch. So these are really basic, but what I find interesting in teaching these material is the craft and uh, storytelling, and also the physical experience of building something together with a group of people. And as an artist, I show this as a sculpture and installation, and I make tons of drawings um, to explain this, because I just find this really visually interesting. And what do our students make? Um, one example is a Mariko Kosaka, um, she was really fascinated by the idea of knitting and code. So she made a, a JavaScript, she, no, she made a Chrome extension that translates bitmap image into knitting pattern. And we helped her to tell the story through the notes and stories. And another project is uh, my fr one of my students, um, Ishak Bertran, who wanted to slow down the time. So he created a game that operates at a one clock cycle per day. You have to be really patient. And our teachers collaborate with students. So my co-founder, Zach Lieberman, is a prolific uh, programmer and an artist. So he was really fascinated about historic software art that were, that were created in the 1960s and 70s. And he teaches uh, this um, work. And works with the students to recreate the work with uh, modern language like C++ or other languages. And students present their project at the end of the 10 weeks program, and that's a, you know, that, that's a big part of their learning experience. This one project is by Marcus Fleming, who was a student about a year ago. And he, after the session, he decided to become a social worker, a, ther a therapist, and particularly for tech workers, because um, he worked as a tech worker, his father was a tech worker, and there's a lot of stress and anxiety that comes from being a tech worker. So this this station is to help the tech worker with their emotional problems. And it's like a ticketing system for them. And as an organizer at the school, what I've been thinking about is that you cannot have diversity without diversifying your leadership. So there's a lot of talk about inclusion, but I think it's really changing the direction and the leaders of the spaces that lead into diversity of the community. And I'll tell you like how we did it, is that just, you just have to hire people who look different than other deans and professors. And that's kind of hard because like the people who are in the position of privilege or the people who have you know, their permanent professorship, basically they need to give up their space for other people to come in and they're not gonna do that. So how do we do that? How do we create um, new spaces that are inclusive and more radical and progressive? One project was a New York Tech Zine Fair that happened um, in 2018 in December. And it was a one-day one event to celebrate DIY publications around technology. And there's many reasons why people want to make zines about tech. I think there's concerns about privacy and security of putting things online, so they would prefer to create their own publications on paper. It was led by Mimi Onuha, who's a wonderful researcher, artist, and uh, educator, who is an author of a book called The People's Guide to AI. The book that I recommend to a lot of people because it was designed and written for people who don't consider themselves as technical folks, but, but, but are affected by AI. 
This is a team, Neta Bomani, who I mentioned earlier, who was my student, and Mimi and Ritsu Gia. So these are the four group of organizers. And this is an image from all the vendors. So we had quite a few vendors, and they came from different places, and it was really successful. And you know, it was very popular. We had people waiting around the block to get in. And that was really interesting to think about that. And it was also really good for them because some of them made a lot of money. And I think as an organizer, when our community could um, you know, create income from what they love to do, I think that's a really good thing. Some of the stars, Amy Weibo of the Bubble Sort Zines. And Amy is quite well known for making these really smart and cute zines, such as this one called How Do Calculators Even? And these are uh, drawings by Julia Evans, who's quite well known in the tech zine community, writing um, you know, zines about protocols and computing frameworks. How does DNS work? <laughs> this is Richard Spencer getting punched in the face for an hour. Uh, this is the basement labs that are trans transferring digital files into VHS formats. <laughs> Resilient communities that are making mesh networks. Hyperlink Press, that's uh, celebrating the queer Asian identity. Ren McDonald, who's a um, visual storyteller um, working specifically with Rizograph. Melanie Hoff, who asked young um, people what they think Alexa or Google Home looks like. And it's quite amazing, actually, because Melanie went back to these kids after a few years and asked them to draw the Alexa again. And it just gets darker and darker. <laughs> yeah, it was a fairy at one year, and then it's like a you know, creature the other year. Detroit Community Tech Project is a really big inspiration for, for me and my community. They're a group of activists based in Detroit that are trying to empower the local communities to have, have access to tech and to be empowered to you know, have their voice. They would do something as like mapping the internet uh, resources in Detroit and setting up the routers in you know, spaces that actually don't have internet services. Kelly Anderson is a you know, wonderful illustrator and a, I think she calls herself paper engineer actually. And this book became a camera. So it's very interesting, like paper craft projects. So this is the kind of work that we celebrate at the school and whimsical, poetic, and fun. But I, I think that's, that's, that's just a part of the, what we do. Now I want to show you what we've been doing to, to be more in line with the idea of a community technology and the social practice. Last year, we did our first offsite. I think this mic is cutting out a little bit, right? All right, is this okay? I th we did a first offsite program um, in the and um, it was a really inspiring experience because Detroit is very different from New York. Um, um, of Detroit is you know smaller than Michigan, which is right around it, and also New York. And the kind of things that we take for such as um, most of our students have laptops. And students in Detroit, you know, I think a lot of them do not own a laptop, and not to mention uh, something that could, you know, compile C++ and uh, Xcode. So we had to redesign our curriculum to be inclusive for them. So we use Raspberry Pi to, um, you know, run our curriculum. Python as opposed to high, high code, high, um, what is it? I think this mic is cutting out, yeah. Maybe we should give you a handheld. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, we had to redesign the curriculum. And I'll show you a quick video from the student's point of view.
I feel like one of the things that I took away from the session was you know, kind of having a deeper inquiry into you know, how is technology created, what's the growth and like, the resources required for it, and will that sustain us for the near future? technology for me um, brings to mind the album of Miss Education of Lauryn Hill, where I have to also unlearn what I thought technology was. Uncovering technology is about looking at the history of technology and who is responsible for designing that and thinking about who else could be responsible for making those decisions and what might technology look like. Peeling back the layers of some of our most common devices from our phones to our laptops to reveal the hidden logic underneath them and to create a more meaningful and joyful relationship with our devices. At SFPC Detroit, I taught peer-to-peer -peer folder poetry, a class where students used the common practice of folder organization as a new kind of poetic form. Through naming and organizing nested folders, they could create choose-your-own-adventure poetry and map spatial relationships like a village or a home. I taught critical theory of computation, and we read a couple of texts that look at the history of the United States and also the creation of technology within Silicon Valley to learn more about that context and some of the injustices that took place prior to those things happening. One of the things I learned was to take a critical lens to technology through the lens of history and race. And we had a wonderful speaker called Tawana Petty who uh, discussed with us the effects of facial recognition within Detroit um, and how we should resist Project Greenlight and that surveillance doesn't necessarily mean safety. So out of our data bodies project, we then uh, started to realize that Project Greenlight was coming to Detroit. And through that research, realizing that there was this right to refusal that we've um, discovered, we realized that there was these themes of community members wanting to be seen and not watched. And so then that helped to inform our resistance to Project Greenlight within the city and getting community members to understand that surveillance is not safety. So, um, Tawana Petty is part of the Detroit Community Tech Project and, um, you know, Equitable Internet Initiative. And what, what she was mentioning that at the Project Greenlight is that, you know, there's like surveillance cameras every year in Detroit between, that is an agreement between the police and then the private, you know, store owners and there's a lot of data that's getting collected without the consent of the community. And that affects certain demographics more than the others. And Learning about that conditions of uh, digital inequalities and also thinking about the students' life in the city, I would say the teachers who came from New York, there were about um, six of them, we learned so much about technology and social justice. So it was a very um, rewarding experience for us as well. And that's something that I feel really um, happy about that we're not just like, you know, this. You know, white savior syndrome of like, we're gonna come to your community with a 3D printer and gonna revolutionize your production facility. Like that kind of like colonizing method is very problematic in my perspective. So we, we approach with a humbleness and we try to collaborate and learn with the local communities there. I'm gonna skip this video just for the sake of time. And I'll talk briefly about how this relates to my work with accessibility and disability. Um, I, I was a very sick child, so I was born, um, born with an illness and disease, and I spent a lot of time in hospitals and through multiple operations. And even with that experience of the trauma, of the pain, and this imminent presence of death, I really did not understand like the relationship between my body, my impairment and disability until recently. And I think that has to do with my upbringing in South Korea where it's a very heteronormative and gender conforming and ableist society. And there's a term called lookism, which is that people just judge you by your you know, external appearances. And I just grew up with that. That's all, all, everything I consumed in the pop media or my social relations was that. So I was conditioned to think that, oh, I'm not disabled, I'm not impaired, I'm just ill. And 
I think that runs deep and that manifests as a very uh, kind of bigoted and um, kind of you know, discriminatory behaviors and things that I have said to other people. And I've been trying to unlearn that through my work and organizing and my friendship with people. And it's been very rewarding. And I would say that you should try to do that as well. Because one thing that we have in common, like that everyone has in common, is that uh, we're all going to die. And um, I think the fact that our life is finite and that we are always going to be um, in, in the presence of illness or of ourselves or other people is what could possibly unite us as well. So I don't think about disability as somebody else's problem. I think it's a shared problem. And then I got into much more political idea about disability rights and how there's a, a conditions of society that disables people rather than their own ability, such as you know not having accessible spaces or just not allowing disabled people to enter certain environments. And one friend who inspired me to push this further was an um, artist named Christine Sun Kim. And I'll show you the project that I did with her. She just uh, did an American Sign Language for the um, national anthem at the Super Bowl, just like a week or two ago. So you might have seen her in, in the TV. But she was born profoundly deaf, and she uses sign language to communicate. And we were thinking about different languages and different times and the multiplicities of different um, languages in certain environments. Because uh, her parents are Korean, um, they immigrated to US, and they learned sign language when Christine was born. So in that household, there were multiple languages and translations at the same time. So this is part of our performance. So this was an hour-long performance um, in which we created seven wind chimes and we had these tapes that participants were putting some black tapes on and then that was triggering the wind chimes to activate in a certain way. Um, the performance is quite complex, but I, I would like to say that the most interesting part for me was that the translations that were happening between American Sign Language and Korean Sign Language and uh, the fact that we had to have like three different interpreters between languages. And that, that's the key, is that just appreciation of diversity and there's no one solution to you know, people's disabilities or their needs or their desires. And I've been writing about this, um, such as this piece called Artificial Advancement. Um, I often find these like you know, university students making technical innovations and thinking that they can solve disability, I just think that's so problematic. Like, I, was this University of Washington? It, it may be, but there was a one group of students who made a glove and thought they could like interpret sign language into spoken words. Is that U University of Washington? I think that's just so messed up <laughs> for, for a lot of reasons. And I'll tell you why. Because, so they didn't really understand sign language. So, this finger spell is like saying A, B, C, D, E. We don't communicate that way, right? There's a full sentence, then there's a full like affect. And this, the signing of the finger is just a small part of the communication. It's a spatial thing, it's a facial expression, it's, it's like the combination of body. And 
and I think the deaf community got really upset when that project got such a huge mainstream attention because it just gives them the, the public a wrong impression of what the sign language is. And they didn't really consult the deaf community when they were developing it. So my friend Christine got upset and she wrote something online and I was researching about why that technology would never actually work even if they have all the sensors that's required. And I think that's just come from lack of understanding about the, the users or the, the people you're trying to serve. So there's a term that, you know, never about us without us. And I think that's just the basic of any ethical design or technology work is that respect the people that you are trying to serve. Don't try to, you know, walk in with tech and just solve their question, problem. Involving people in the design process is not just about having more user, user test. It's really about empowering the communities to uh, design technology themselves. And I've been teaching deaf and blind people to code and do you know, soldering and electronic stuff for some time. And the kinds of idea that they have is just so fascinating. And I think us as able-bodied engineers and designers, our job is to support their you know, idea rather than us coming up with the solution. And I think this is where the ethical question about our place in the tech industry comes into the key uh, issue. So the redefined um, notion of poetic computation for me is that it's an inquiry into non-oppressive and liberatory and equitable community technology. And the, for, for the last part, I wanna try to unpack these words into what I actually mean. I think we all understand the issues of centralization of you know, the big tech companies aggregating our data and the surveillance capitalism as we know. But let's just think about the essence of what we need to achieve. The concept of control is really important for computing, right? We want to have control over different spaces. But let me just try to propose that I think care might be more important than uh, control this progressive act of uh, stewardship and maintenance. And I wrote this letter to a friend who works at Google, and I gave this part of the talk at the Google's annual design conference. And I'm gonna read this part for you because I think you all might enjoy it too. So, dear friend, how are you? I'm okay. It's been, okay. It's been busy. So last we spoke, we talked about drawing a line around ethics, like what is wrong, what is not. So you work in the tech, you work for a tech giant, and I'm showing my art in a museum that's funded by unethical military contractors. So there are similarities in, the, in our relationship to ethics of tech and capitalism and violence. And I was, at this time, I was preparing a show for the Whitney Museum which had a huge scandal with uh, you know, people who produce you know, tear gases and other machines, and they're sitting at the board level, influencing some of the decision-making of the arts and cultural institution. And sometimes lines take over, because it's not so, so much of black and white. It, there's a lot of grayscale between the evil and not evil. And we're trying to do good work, but you know, sometimes the lines take over. And as you work in the tech industry, you just become less sensitive and you notice yourself becoming very complicit to these evil c companies. Well, tech reflects our societies, um, its beauty and its faults and also its limitations. There's a carceral technology or carceral system, which means like this the prison system, but it actually goes back to the colonial system. The colonial machines become carceral machines that becomes industrial machines that also reflect on the educational and academic machines. They all share the same code of control. And in these spaces, the white supremacy and sexism and ableism just are just replicated through different forms. And I see that in the code that people write or the AIs that people model is reflecting of their biases. But the famous Bartleby code of like, I would prefer not to, that's just such an easy cop out to say that it's a default mode of a neoliberal subject. I just think we should not be so pessimistic or helpless. And let's not conflate our active contribution to unjust causes with complicity like when we work for tech giants or military industrial complexes, 
we're actually helping them grow. And weaponizing design towards the minority and the environment, such as surveillance and excessive or abusive computing. You know, this is part of what we do that leads to erasure of certain communities or you know, extraction and extinction of you know, the really pre uh, precious, uh, precious nat natural you know, species. So what do we do? I return to my friend, Nabil Hossein, who says, we must repair all of our relationships, not for anyone else's sake, but for our own. We must repair all of our relationship, not for anyone else's sake, but for our own. And he said this in a, a talk called Computing Climate Change and All of Our Relationships. This is Nabil, and he was one of the teachers in Detroit for SFPC. And he's wearing a shirt call of, that says, no new jails in NYC. He's an abolitionist, and he does a prison um, abolition movement work, as well as thinking about mathematics and computer science. So for him and our community, the top priorities that I want to share with you is that abolition that is, that's in tandem with the emancipation. So really, what is the freedom that we desire today, in 2020, for the next 50 years? What, how can you think about decolonizing and also the re-indigenization of the communities in, and the land and our bodies and our imagination? So these are really hard questions because we just need to entirely change how we think about our place in the world. So I return to the care and I think about the privileges that I have, that we have, and the responsibilities that we have and been thinking about how can we code to care? And I think internet is just, you know, it's just the computer, it's just the largest computer that's ever built. So if we can change the code of our computer, can we change the code and code of conduct of the internet? And this is a distributed web of care that I've been researching on. Like the map of the internet is very well known. The, the distinctions between centralization, decentralization, and distribution. You know, it's, a, it's a classic you know, thing that we learn in schools. The real distributed network is a little bit more complicated. This is a graphic from Alexander Galloway's book, Protocol, that illustrates a distributed network. That's a connect, connection between X and Y. So other than a more uniform uh, web, it really looks like this broken structures of different paths. And being a nerd that I am, I get really excited about protocols. So um, there are a few code that I, I'm excited about. The one is called DAT. It's a um, decentralized file sharing protocol that bypasses HTTP. So you can share files remotely and creating a unique hash. The other is a secure Scutterbutt, which is like social, um, social networking um, protocol. And it's an online first experience. So it prioritizes people who met and shared a Wi-Fi router. So I was using these protocols and trying to build internet on my own. And I was like, I made a computer, so I'm just going to make my own internet. But I realized I was actually becoming a tyrant that I was trying to criticize. Like, everyone needs to follow my rules. So I think about code of conduct, and we do this really elaborate activities at the school, and the work that I do, like, really designing the code of conduct together, and what is accepted behavior, and what is expected of each other. Because, as I said, like, computers are just rocks that are talking to each other and they reflect the human relations. And I think it's quite prob problematic to criticize like AI or certain data set for making bad decisions. You know, it's actually humans who train them. Yeah, this connection of network and relations and thinking about computers as a human habitat, the, hu the places that we share and almost like a species that we live with it, that has changed how I think about my role as artist and educator. The code of conduct leads to more caring environment. And 
I will just be really honest that I really struggle with this too because I've been criticized for things that I've said or you know biases that I have and the hardest thing is to accept that you were wrong and you have to own it and I ask you to have the courage to you know acknowledge that we are not perfect and nobody is I often tell my students like what happens when a racist says something bad to you at a bar you you walk away you, there's no point of like getting engaged with this drunk racist like it's a waste of your time but what do you do when you're like classmate or somebody you share spaces with makes a racist comment. It's your responsibility and if, if you choose, you're, you're right to correct them and to advise them to change because you're going to have to share the spaces. Yes, it's, it is unfair to be a minority and to be burdened with extra work of you know, trying to improve this other racist person, but it's going to make your life much more habitable if you can coexist. So this comes to the idea of coding carefully. Yeah, while we want to be efficient and you know, good at our technical skills, coding carefully is not just about you know, being, becoming a better programmer. It's really thinking about how you code and how you, for example, make a pull request on a GitHub. Like, how can you be less you know, aggressive? How can you respect the work that other people have done? How can you coexist? And this kind of work that comes back to the idea of understanding my relationship with other people in spaces and mapping them out, such as this drawing that I made with a friend, uh, Quarley Guarshan. And using the protocol that I mentioned, like the DAT or Secure Scutterbutt, I've been publishing the essays about different futures for the internet on this tiny computer that's serving local Wi-Fi and also remote access. And I've been asking my writer friends and critics to think about finding intimacy within black feminist criticism. And just as a context, I'm bringing in like critical theory into distributed web space. And distributed web space has mostly has contents about distributed web. So, you know, it's like mostly European and Australian engineer, mostly white men just talking about how cool their cryptographic programs are, who I love and got to know, and they are really progressive in many ways, but I would say that a lot of this, they were la they're thirsty for more diversity of voices. So Ari Malanciano talked about building a museum 353 years into the future where the black culture is respected. Shannon Finnegan wrote about accessibility dreams where it's not just the ADA com compliance technology, it's really about finding beauty and poetry inside of accessibility. And this relates to the habitat, the ecologies, the, you know, the spaces that we share. So I co-organized a conference about code ecologies. And a lot of that information is on our website and most of our stuff is on our GitHub, so you should be able to find it. I'm not going to get so much into detail of the code ecologies, but I'll tell you a story that I've been you know, writing is that about old phones. And I've been asking people who have phones that are five years or older. Um, my phone is about five, six, uh, five years old, but I think this is older. And I've been asking how they maintain their phone and why they do that. And it's been so fascinating. So this person is doing this for political reason and they, buy, um, they bought an iPhone 4S for $20, and they maintain it. And they don't fix it, uh, the broken, broken parts of it, because it just costs more than $20 to fix you know, the battery or the screen. But they keep it because it works, and then um, they find it kind of better for their emotional um, well-being to not have smart um, applications all the time. There are a lot of risk with it because the software stops updating at a certain point. So, th yeah, the, the, you know, you can't, you, there's a security and privacy issues if you're concerned about that. But uh, this, this comes to the point about maintenance and care. And rather than thinking about the flashy new technology, can we work with what we have? And can we think about different stories that we can tell with that? So, I would like to, uh, open this up to the audience if they have any questions or comments. Hi.
Hi, there's a question over there. First of all, thank you for this talk. It was really great. Um, I want to challenge you regarding a couple of things um, that you showed and talked about. Um, to me, it seems like that you're anthropomorphizing technology in many ways, and I find that problematic a little bit um, because we know that that sort of also thinking is what led to the Anthropocene. So I would like you to comment on that. Wow, <laughs> such a hard question. <laughs> did everyone hear that question? Okay. Oh, th some, some people did not. So I think um, the... Uh, should I repeat? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, you're anthropomorphizing technology. So you're giving to the technology, to general technologies aspects of human beings in a way. And you talk about networks in the same way we, uh, that of course metaphorically we can think about them that way, but you showed the skits where two computers are like equal to two human beings. Um, also at the beginning where you showed like the infrastructure of a computer um, and a network and it looked like earth, like, like a landscape. So, I think there's a problematic in that, uh, that is sort of dangerous because it leads to questions of like um, how we see and how we understand our relationships with non-humans, basically, with other than human entities. So if you would like to comment on that. I need to think about that because that's such a good question. Yeah, I mean, I I guess first, first the defense and possibly a uh, response was that I, my audience are quite young, usually. I, young in many ways, uh, like just I like young people, children, but also people who are new to technical concept. So I, I position myself as a translator between the technical folks and non. And I think using comics and centering a human metaphor is a one way of making it accessible. I do see your criticism about centering too much on the humans leads to lack of accountability for the larger habitat or the natural environment. And we see that with the abuse of you know, computing power or you know, abuse of natural resources. Um, I find that to be you know, really urgent issues that we should address. Um, I think it's it's a lot about my to, to, the answer is that I think it's about my personality and like the my way of storytelling is the the approach that I've taken. Um, I think there are amazing artists who are working about Anthropocene or natural resources in a very very critical in way that I respect. Um, I just can't bring myself to make work that way because it just feels a little cold to me. Um, I'm much more interested in the humor and poetry, and even in the most critical perspective, I think we can find um, a way of, of creating beauty out of it. Thank you. Yes, there's a question over in the back. Thank you very much for um, uh, many thought-provoking ideas that you um, brought to us today. Uh, I brought a number of students. Unfortunately, they had to leave early. Their class only went until 7.30. Um, but they did pose a couple of questions. Um, I will only give you a couple of them. <laughs> um, we're uh, studying religion and information technology in my uh, class that I teach. And uh, AI consciousness, uh, transhumanism um, as well. And so they are curious kind of what your thoughts are on this whole idea of uh, transcendence and whether AI could achieve consciousness, um, knowing what we know about computing now. Um, and then the second question is kind of more related to um, your inclusivity and the things that you teach and uh, kind of what kinds of space you make for uh, diversity and inclusivity and relationship to religion and religious ideas that might be brought into the classroom in the form of art and 
um, those kinds of things and using technology to produce religious artifacts and things like that. So two uh, different questions. So <laughs> interesting. Religion, wow. Um, the first question I, I can't really answer about transcendence and AI. Um, I think it's possible, just like anything else is possible, but I, I feel I'm not equipped to answer that right now. The second question I'm more interested in answering because um, I grew up in a Christian environment, so I, I understand and respect religious tradition, and um, really, I think everyone has right to their religion. Um, I think when I think about conventional organized religion, I just think about colonialism and how that religious ideas manifest in such a violent manner. So I have a very deep um, kind of anger against the uh, organized religion. But it's been, that has also been, you know, changing or it's been challenged. Like I worked for um, North Korean defectors and they, there are a group of people who um, are North Korean by ethnicity, but they were actually born in China because uh, you know, their parents were uh, refugees and they're not given a legal status either in Korea or North Korea or China, so they're stateless. And it was actually the Christian missionaries who took them in and sort of you know, took care of them to adjust to the new societies. And I volunteered to teach coding to these kids. And that was really interesting to think about the role of religion in a, in a space where the, um, the state or other kinds of NGOs start to uh, you know, miss because it just doesn't have a support structure. It's not about faith or the religion at its core. It's more about the, what can a religious organization can do that I really value that, um, that I, as, a, as an organizer, I just think they're doing amazing activism work um, under the name of re religion. I mean, they are converting these kids into Christians, so there's something that I find a little bit problematic because the, the way that um, Christianity is organized in Korea is very much, um, it, it, I'll say it's just problematic. And um, yeah, so I think that's one response that I could give to you. Um, Thank you. I really appreciate uh, your concern about place, and uh, much of your presentation was, a, was about place. Um, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit about materials in place, the materials that you um, were working with don't seem to have a place. They, they exist everywhere, they come from everywhere, but yet you're using them within a place. So I'm wondering if you could talk about materials and craftsmanship and, and place and how those ideas fit into your, into your program of work? Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, my practice is changing a lot these days. Um, I realize that I'm obsessed with places and things and people and their relationship. And I'm thinking a lot about natural materials and um, thinking about non-electronic computers through textiles or paper or rocks and learning a lot from indigenous people in different communities. I'm doing a, planning a research trip in Laos to work with some of the weavers there. Um, I think the electronics are become these black boxes that it's just a little hard to know, you know, how they're made. Um, I had a is that like 2011 MacBook Pro? Like one of those older machines that um, could have a, you could open up the back and then change the battery. And I tried to replace the battery and I, I thought I knew a thing or two about electronics, but I, I really failed to you know, replace a battery. And I think that really shows that, um, you know, it's really hard to get a sense of the things, where they come from. A friend of mine, um, was an artist and he tried to make a toaster by scratch. So he went to the mountains and collected the coal and you know sanded everything and tried to make a toaster. It took him like eight months and even with that effort, like he couldn't actually make a toast out of the toaster. Um, and it's interesting to think about the next project that he did was that he tried to become a goat 
and he made uh, these apparatuses to sort of walk and eat and behave like a goat in a mountain. And I think that comes to the point about the things and places. So he started from a thing, uh, the industrial object, and hit the end of it, hit the limit of it, and then the question like, can I actually become a natural thing that exists in the part of the ecosystem? I think there's one more question. Can I just get that? Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to talk to you. Um, I will bring a very boring question about your school operations. Like, um, I wonder the proportion of engineer-based student and artist artistic background student, because I assume that um, artists have enough incentive to learn how to code, but engineers, um, they have to sacrifice their promising salary of a big tech giant. So art, becoming an artistic engineer is kind of a very brave thing. So I wonder that, is there a, enough student who want to learn art, arts with a background of technology? And another question is about the, if you're kind of small private ac academy or school, can be a very idealistic idea, like because it can um, it can give enough opportunity to um, learn very flexible way, an interdisciplinary way, but it means that there should be a lack of kind of scholarship because of the school size. So it it cannot kind of include many um, disabled students or low income based students. So that it, there was. Yeah, the first question about engineers and artists, yeah, we try to have a mix of the two, and there's also other third type who are more of a admin or a operational folks. Um, I would actually say that there's a lot more engineers who want to become creative and artistic rather than artists trying to learn to code. Um, in the beginning, it was definitely the more artists trying to learn code, but we've sort of made a name for ourselves for being a critical space where engineers could really challenge what they do. And as you might know, a lot of people who work in tech spaces are so confused about what they're doing and really dis disheartened by how their time and their creativity is going to either useless or problematic causes. So I think critical thinking is very attractive and that's probably what they're missing in their lives. And, um, and they, and I would even challenge that even people who have computer science degree, they don't know how to code in the way that, that we do. They don't know how to make art with technology in the way that we do, so there's a lot to learn there. The other part about scholarship and such is that, yeah, that's a big issue, and we are beginning to work with philanthropy and other organizations to offer scholarships. The Detroit project was um, entirely uh, uh, free, so that, um, we, we charged a little bit, but we gave it back to the people, and all the teachers were paid. And we're still small in a sense that we can't just like run this huge scholarship projects, but idea is that eventually it will be a mix of a paid program and free program. But I, I come from an organizing space, so I was doing a lot of free school pro, uh, programs during the Occupy Wall Street and such. And I would say that pay, uh, charging tuition has been a real blessing in a way because it's a social contract. It, everyone's really committed by it. Um, we charge $6,000 for our 10 weeks program. And um, it's, it's expensive, but compared to graduate schools that are comparable to our experience, it's just so much more cheaper. Like, so I think it's relative. Like in Europe, people are not used to paying that much, uh, but in US, people are. And part of that is also just being in a New York. Like the whole experience is about being in a creative space and c building that community. So New York is just an expensive place. We do think about doing more programs in other places or remote learning, especially for disabled people. Um, and the other thing about the pay of money is that we try to pay our people very well because we come from being an adjunct uh, professor for so long. So we. I think we pay better than other private schools in New York. And that's also important to be supportive for the communities who are doing this work. So we try to think about money as a vehicle to realize our educational and activism practices. Um, yeah. So if you would like, 
Would you join me in the stage? And we're going to do some activity that involves kind of participatory thing with movement. You can leave your bag stuff over there. Just a note is that if you come here, you may be videographed. So if you don't want to, you can stay right outside. But I, there's, a, there's a, some yarn that I borrowed from my friend Aphrodite, who just asked the first question, of, the hardest question of all. And then, <laughs> yeah, could you come over here if you want? Oh, so good to see everybody so close. You're so far away. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'd like to do some activities with the time that we have today. And um, I, think, I think I just want it to be a cat. I just you know, play with yarn. Um, <laughs> the first is that now we are all here. Let's just take a breath really, really slowly. And then let's try to look at one person into their eyes. And let's change and look at another person. Another person. Another person. And one more person. Okay, so we know that we exist here. Yeah, I, I really like performance art. I think I just wanted to be a performance artist and got into computers. Um, the next thing is that we're gonna find a partner and one person, just two person, and the one person will have their hand. Uh, let's have uh, your right hand, this one, facing up. And then the other person will have it facing down. And the person who's leading is a person whose palm is facing down. And I will have my eyes open. And then you will have your eyes closed. And I'm the guardian of this person now. I'm the steward of this person. I have to be really gentle to navigate this person around the stage. And make sure that we don't fall. And be really gentle and move around, right? That's clear, right? Um, can we actually have the screen go up and, yeah. So let's find a partner.
Okay, now pause. 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 Shh. Hi, everyone. I'd like to introduce two new rules. Can I have everyone's attention? I'd like to introduce two new rules. One is that you cannot use spoken language with each other. Can I have you as a model, please? So we'll be, you'll have your eyes closed and we'll be navigating silently. At any moment in this journey, the person who had their palms up, who had their eyes closed, can turn and open your eyes, and now you're leading me, and now I'm being guided. But let's say I'm feeling a little insecure, and like I need to go slow. We communicate through the touch, and if I feel really, oh, I feel unsafe, I'm gonna come back. That makes sense, right? So no speaking, and we're gonna alternate. Did everyone hear? No, I didn't. Okay, just one more time. Now, no speaking between the individual and then the person who had their um, palms up, the person with their eyes closed, could always turn the palm and then the roles change. Mm -hmm. So now I need to close eyes and then the eye gets up. Make sure that and you're no talking. Right? No talking, okay. but make sure that one of you have your eyes open. <laughs>
this is a time to come. It's not too late. Okay. The final activity is a little bit more adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> and this is especially challenging because there's a huge cliff there. So I don't want anyone to fall. So we need to be really taking care of each other. The idea is that now there's no one leader or follower. Um, it's going to happen organically. With this VR, we're going to try to create the network, the network that we want to have. And we have to be really mindful and careful when we're engaging with this network. Because you know, if not, if we don't do that, we might fall, we might get hurt. There's no exact rule, rule except one proposition is that if you're touching the string, you have to close your eyes, and then you have to be always moving. So you can't just stand up and you have to be slowly moving. And it will get tangled, and we need to untangle it, and we need to be really mindful about this. And I'll tell you like why we do this first, so you have the context. Is that um, I've been working with various disability communities to think about different ways of communicating. And one big no-no in the disability advocacy is to experience blindness or experience deafness, because that's a very ableist construct to temporarily experience you know, not having a some certain uh, sensory or motor skills. Instead, what they suggest is that to appreciate and experience interdependence and collaboration. Because as you might know, like, you know, we're all connected. And I think that is, this activity is designed to give you a sense of commons and a shared affect, as opposed to lack of a sight, for example. So we do this activity with blind and sighted people and deaf and non-deaf people as well. I think None of the group here identifies deaf or blind, but I, I would assume that you have other experiences of illness and disability and impairment that you might relate to. But this activity starts very gently. I'm going to pass this to one person, this person, and your job is to um, extend the network and give it to somebody else, and then you're going to hold it from there. Does that make sense? You want to do? Yeah. become the node at that point. And as a node, you're always moving.
to come into the network with their eyes open. And we're going to create a moving sculpture, all of us. And we don't need to close our eyes, but we have to be really gentle because we don't want to hurt other people. But what we can do is like we can engage and disengage in any point. So you can connect here or you can go other places. But idea is just to think about the lines that we are creating. All right? Let's try that. And no spoken words, please.
thanks for being part of the network. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm super happy to have met you. Um, I'm gonna put up my contact info again so you can find me. But I'm gonna need your help to <laughs> untangle this. <laughs> so just be gentle with the network as I go around and make it into a, a usable yarn again. But it's been nice to meet you and hope to see you again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.